So welcome everyone to our intermediate level grades four and five presentation of the new piano syllabus 2021 to 2023. So before we do begin this, I'd like to talk a little bit about the digital grades and diplomas, which is what we have as far as exams go at this point of time. So most of you are aware and have been taking these exams. They were launched in November, and I must say they're very popular and people are enjoying doing these. They are enjoying the fact that they can continue the teaching as well as the candidates can continue learning while they work towards a certification. So it's a video recording of the pieces and the technical work, which is uploaded on our online platform. And then it is assessed by our examiners. But rest assured, these exams have the same academic rigor as our face-to-face -face exams. The candidates get full recognition and the UPS points as are awarded for the face-to-face -face exams. And another very important uh, point that I must bring to your notice is that these digital exams will continue alongside the face-to-face -face exams when they do start, which we hope will be soon. So you may choose which one you would like to take. Also, there is no closing date for the digital exams. You can choose your month, date, and make your entry according to that. We will facilitate the exam. So right through this presentation, we will be putting up some poll questions. So do answer them because it matters to us what our markets think and what the teachers really feel. So we have some very relevant questions and we'd love your feedback. So do answer those. They will happen during the presentation. So let's now move straight into the new piano syllabus intermediate level. I would also, before I begin, like to welcome my co-presenters. We have Priya Chaturvedi, from Deradu, Senior Academic Consultant. We have Farida from Pune and Akriti from Delhi. They will be presenting today with me. And behind the scenes team is also there to answer all your questions and give you all that you need in the chat box. Krizan and Dini are available for that. So the new piano syllabus has new performance pieces at all levels. There's new technical work exercises at all levels and also new graded exam books, this time available in two editions. We will talk about that a little later. This syllabus will coexist with the 2018 to 21 up to 31st December, 2021. So in case you are planning to take the exam and using this old syllabus, you must prepare everything from the old syllabus, that is the 2018 to 2021. Or if you're using the new syllabus, make sure you choose pieces and technical work from the new syllabus. But just remember, we are going to be talking about the widest repertoire there is in this syllabus. So you will see that all the pieces from the 2018 syllabus are also included in the 2021 syllabus. Uh, just before I begin now, I'd like to say we are not taking raised hands, so please don't raise your hand. Just put whatever you need in the chat box. It will be addressed. So an overview of what is in store for you today. The largest ever repertoire, and we're going to look at the rationale behind it. We are also going to look at the young composers, competition winners, and their pieces. We will be defining the repertoire balance of pieces in the various levels 
as per period, composer, styles, and the level. And a large chunk of the presentation will be learning outcomes and assessment criteria. And this time we will be applying this to specific pieces. So there's a lot in store, let's get on with it. I know a little bit will be repeated because we have used the generic topics, kept them the same for all the presentations. So bear with us, please. There may be some people who are attending for the first time. So this repertoire, as I said earlier, is the largest ever we have had till date. 35 pieces per grade. And the pieces are from the 2018-20 syllabus and also from earlier ones. These have also been included. So you have a vast range to choose from. So let's now Think about why Trinity has done that. What is the rationale behind such a large selection of pieces? It gives us an opportunity as teachers and of course the students to explore and access this vast literature of piano, literature, of piano music that is available. Also, because of so many pieces and varied styles and technical demands, it develops te technique and musicality through the variety. It uses many styles, structures, and compositional devices in the pieces. This helps widen knowledge and understanding of music and our instrument, the piano. There is music from world cultures, this, as we all know, promotes critical appreciation of music. The syllabus pieces showcase tonal, harmonic, and melodic versatility of the piano and enable projection of skills and strength in performance, as well as in an exam setting. The piano as a medium for expressiveness and interpretation, we all know that it's a great instrument. These character pieces that are included, plus program music, dance forms, are all beautifully apt for our instrument. There are pieces also from earlier syllabi, going back to 2012 which really provide a continuity with the familiar. The body of piano literature we know is rooted in a tradition that is a living one. The past influences the present and the present includes the changes in our world mirrored in music or through music. So in a nutshell, there is something for everyone in our new piano syllabus. You can choose whatever you would like to play and also experiment with other pieces. There is a poll question here. Once you answer that, we will be moving on to the next section. And I would like to invite my colleague Farida from Pune to take over now and talk about the pieces by the winners of the Young Composers competition. Thank you, Anjali. Good evening to all of you. The Young Composers competition was a unique and extremely fulfilling part of this new syllabus. And the syllabus includes pieces by winners of this competition, thereby celebrating the power of youth through the works of living composers and worldwide young people who have contributed to this competition. It has thereby given exposure to all these young people, composers and pianists, to be able to access the idiom of today's classical music across a wide variety of cultures. 
Let's take a look at some of the new composers who have been included in the 21-23 syllabus. We first have Maria Mifsud, who is from Malta and has written an extremely beautiful and poignant little piece called Remembrance. As the title suggests, Remembrance is a recollection of memories and it's an extremely reflective piece of music portraying a wide range of emotions, going from absolute joy to very, very bittersweet. There is an aura of serenity and beautifully expressed, gently flowing arpeggios, descending thirds, and a haunting melody line in the upper register. Let's listen to Remembrance from the grade four syllabus. In the grade five syllabus, we have the extremely talented Gillen Fox from Warwickshire in the UK. He says, I love that composing music allows you to express your feelings in a way that no other medium can. And the greatest challenge for me is knowing when to stop. The piece we are now going to listen to is A Walk in the Park a cheerful little piece representing a stroll through the park surrounded by the myriad sounds and the sights of nature. The music has a definite relaxed swagger to it and also a bluesy style that comes through very clearly. Let's listen to A Walk in the Park. Moving on to the next part of this webinar, we are now going to showcase some of the pieces that have been taken from the old syllabi. So the current syllabi sees the return of pieces that are not just from previous syllabi, but 
also really older syllabi that were introduced by Trinity years ago. While providing a sense of familiarity, this also gives the young performer a chance to both learn, enjoy, and perform some of these beautiful pieces. And naturally, they have been chosen for their popularity, as well as the fact that they have an enduring musical value. The first piece from grade four is Tower Hill, taken from Farnby's Fitzwilliam Virginal Book. This is an excellent example of the late Renaissance Baroque style of music. The virginal was an instrument that was popularly used during this period, and it was a keyboard instrument. The stylistic elements in this particular piece show a definite celebratory march theme. From grade four, we next have the Sicilian. This was taken from Schumann's album for the young and was a milestone in teaching pedagogy as the entire album was. This piece explores the basic style of a pastoral dance, which is what a Sicilian was. It is lighthearted and there's a lot of challenging finger work and extremely delicate ornamentation. From grade five, we're going to look at sports car. This is a fun piece to learn, exciting and peppy, and composed by the British composer McCabe. There are, however, a number of technical aspects, which include syncopation, left-hand broken chords, and repeated patterns. Definitely making 21st, piano, 21st century piano music at its best. From grade five, we also have Zeuser Traumerei, which means sweet reflection or sweet memories. Once again, this is a highly introspective and reflective piece. It has all the elements of romantic music, including very skillful pedaling, the use of rubato and clear voicing. Thank you, Farida. So now we are going to move on and I'm going to tell you where you can find all these pieces. For the first time, Trinity has taken out two editions of the exam books. The first is an extended edition, which contains the 12 pieces. It gives you access to a nine piece ebook, scales and exercises as scores in the extended edition, performance notes, and as well as access to the audio downloads. There is a digital book of the extended edition also available from our ebook store. Because of the pandemic, Trinity has now launched an ebook store or a digital bookstore where you can download, buy and download all the exam books for all the instruments plus the supporting material. The ebooks and the audios can be accessed from the trinitycollege.com website. The second one is the edition that we are normally used to. There are 12 pieces in it with the exercises. There are the scales and arpeggios listed on the inside back cover. And the new addition here is performance notes. Performance notes used to always be in a teaching notes uh, booklet. So they have done away with that and put it into the book, which I think is extremely useful. And a digital book of this edition is also 
available. You can print out the ebook and use for your examination. So that leaves us with 14 more pieces. Now these are available in Trinity Publications and other publications. They are all listed in the piano syllabus. Our ebook store was launched during the pandemic and we find that it's been really useful. People are very happy to be able to download the books for the piano. This is what is available. The two editions of the exam pieces. There is support material, piano scales and exercises and the oral book and also something that is really useful and new. There is a recital anthology for piano diploma repertoire. Now this is a great new addition and I'm happy to say that for once we can find a selection of pieces, not all the pieces because the repertoire is so large within this book, within this anthology, which will be very, very useful. It's available as a hard copy as well as as an ebook. So much about publications and the Trinity store. I am now going to invite Priya. No, sorry, it's Akriti next, who is going to take the next topic, defining the repertoire as per eras and styles. Thank you, ma'am. Here we will be able to visually see the weightage given to each era of music in the intermediate piano syllabus, and then go ahead to understand why this is so. As you can see the pie, uh, see in the pie, almost one fourth of the pieces are by Baroque and classical composers. The Romantic era pieces have been given the same size of slice as that from the classical. The remaining of the pie, however, is dedicated to modern and contemporary composers. Let's take a look at how this has evolved from the foundation level. While the percentage of Baroque and classical era has stayed nearly the same, as you can see, the inclusion of Romantic era pieces has increased quite a bit. The key features of each of these eras and styles of music is going to help us understand a reasoning behind such a division. Baroque music was filled with embellishments in the mel melody line, brought out by the use of ornaments. Realizing ornamentation is thus very important. It was such a common occurrence, in fact, that often it was not even notated, just improvised. The music contains contrapunctual lines and imitation, which requires effective voicing, because when you are imitating, the melody may shift from one hand to the other. At the time this music was written, there was no piano. Composers mostly played and composed for the harpsichord, which had a sharper sound. So it is important to have clarity of sound and hand coordination definitely plays an important role in that. Economy of movement by controlling the fingers over the keyboard is also very important. Of course, to achieve all of this, one must concentrate on building finger independence. Classical era. So the development of the forte piano, as well as the beginning of pianos as we see today. The music during this time was rich and vibrant, made by the use of mixed articulation that needs to be played evenly. To express this music well, you need to understand the relationship between different keys. Lots of scale passages, broken chords, and fluency of finger movements is required that must be supported with technical facility. Phrasing and cadences shape the music, creating musical punctuations, accompanied by dynamics that gave the music the required flow. In this period, you have minuet and trio, rondo form, sonata form, and the list doesn't end there. So understanding music structure and form is also essential. Unlike the foundation level, now mostly original compositions by Baroque and classical composers are featured at the intermediate level. Due to this, the inclusion of Baroque music is still on the lesser side. 
since the pieces were more often of a much higher difficulty level. Now that the students have been playing the piano for a while, the inclusion of pieces from the Romantic era has really increased. Students by now are skilled enough to use the pedal, bring out the long legato melody lines in a singing style, that is to be able to play cantabile. There are a lot more dynamic nuances here that require instrument control. The music from this period is expressive and requires personal interpretation. Students are now at the level where they start forming their own musical opinions and are thus able to do this. Tempo variations by way of ritardando, rallentando, and rubato, one of the highlights of this time, is required. By now, the students are also comfortable in reading and playing accidentals, which so often find their way into these compositions. So you see why these pieces did not feature much in the foundation level, but have found a significant part in the intermediate level. We move on now to the modern era, where we have also included pieces by contemporary composers and jazz style of music. As the music gets closer to the times we live in, it increases its relatability with today's students. This helps the stu students feel more connected to the music they are performing. This music requires oral and practical familiarity with dissonances. There is also a lot of rhythmic complexity through the use of syncopation, accents, and irregular time signatures. Personal interpretation is promoted through character pieces that are based on an idea, thought, or a story. Imagining that while you play really traps attacks into your creativity. One must understand the musical structure that brings about the narrative of the music. These composers use a much larger range of the keyboard, which is kind of like an exploration journey, especially for the young players. Sudden dynamic changes make the music quite thrilling. The player also has the freedom of interpretation to some extent. These, these musicians play around with the tonality of music. They go beyond the confines of major and minor by exploring modes, pentatonic scales, and whole tone scales for their compositions. All of this encourages personal engagement and interpretation for the students. In 2018, Trinity started the tradition of including pieces by contemporary composers and the modern era. The idea here was to keep renewing classical music, keeping it fresh. Contemporary composers do not have a set style of writing music. Much of their music is a form of personal expression. These are also the teachers of today who use their music to teach the players a variety of skills and techniques. You can learn something new and completely different from each of these pieces. These expose the pianists to world music cultures, inclusiveness, and helps narrow the gap between these composers and piano players. So it makes complete sense to dedicate the majority of syllabus to these composers. Having said that, I would like to remind you that these composers often wrote in Baroque, classical, and romantic style of music. So while pieces by composers from these eras are relatively less, the students get sufficient exposure to the style that they wrote in. To continue the webinar, I would like to I would, I would like to uh, call Priya Ma'am, who's going to take us through the next section. Thanks, Akriti. So we come now to learning outcomes and assessment criteria, very important part of the whole learning and teaching process. So learning outcomes very simply is what the student should learn and assessment is what the examiner will assess. On the screen in front of you, you will see three very distinct sections. And these have been mapped to the three sections in our examination. The first one pertains to the repertoire or the pieces that are going to be performed. The second to the technical work, the scales, arpeggios and so forth. And the third, to the supporting tests and in the current digital examination format to the overall performance section. 
Now to understand how this works in a very specific manner, we're going to take the first section and actually apply it to pieces from these two grades. So let's look at the first piece, which is Etude number 23 by the French composer Henri Lemoyne and see how the first criteria is applied. So supporting intentions in musical performance, which you'll see on the left side of your screen, what does that translate into? It means having knowledge, understanding and skills, which then go together to support these intentions. So first of all, in this specific piece, a very clear knowledge of the playful character of the scherzo. What is a scherzo? Literally translated into Italian, the word means a joke. So this piece is a very playful one and that characteristic has to be understood and known. Also the knowledge that the etude as a form pertains to aspects of technique and is an aid to developing technique. So these aspects of technique are an essential element and they must be identified in this particular piece and worked on accordingly to be able to support those intentions. Again, understanding is needed in how to project the style of the scherzo, the meaning of the etude through the dynamic markings, through the articulation and shaping of phrases. Skill comes in here in a lot of the execution of this work. There are arpeggiated and scalar movements and very important, a precise observations of the rest because we do know that silence as well as sound is very important in music. It goes to create that overall feeling. Let's listen to the piece. charming little work. So let's look at the next point in the assessment criteria. And that is a very important point because it is how does the performer connect with the audience? In this case, the examiner. How do you involve your listener? Music is a performing art above all. So that can really be projected and you can draw your listener in through an understanding of the music that allows a degree of personal interpretation personal engagement, interpretation, some creativity. The meaning of the accents, staccatos, phrase endings, those little rests, it's not enough to just execute them. They must be understood, they must be interpreted as having a place in the overall work. The surprise element, again, comes in here and that requires some creativity in shaping those dynamics now loud, now soft, and the accents. The fluent projection of the many dynamic changes, I would say goes a long way towards aiding a really convincing personal interpretation that will please the listener. And the third part of this section is me and the instrument. Why? Because it pertains to everything that the technique is, that is needed in playing the instrument. Accuracy, fluency, musical awareness, all these things come together to create a good 
sound secure technique. In the etude, there are triplets right in the beginning and they must be executed precisely and rhythmically. There must be a good control of the dynamic changes, both the ones that are gradual and the sudden ones. Articulation must always be correctly observed and that again requires control and command of the instrument and the phrase shaping must be done in a short manner. There is quite a lot of movement across the keyboard in this work. It is of course an etude, so that kind of technical challenge is expected and the movement should be confident and secure in register and in the chordal changes. And of course, all the rests must be done with a confident lifting off and landing on the keyboard. Let's move on to another piece in the grade that is grade four, and that is the very, very appealing Calypso. And here me and the music, what is the Calypso music in this piece all about? It is a knowledge of the Calypso and of the Caribbean context, the music of the West Indians. It is such wonderful, appealing music, as I said, and it has been very wonderfully expressed here by contemporary composer, Philip Knowles. So intentions here must be supported by knowing and understanding this is cheerful music. It has a relaxed sound. It should conjure up a different kind of landscape. Also, what should be understood is that it is not just straightforward from beginning to end. There are changes of mood. There is a section in between, which is in a minor key. And of course, that creates a different mood altogether. And of course, to be able to support all these intentions with skillful and knowledgeable playing, oral familiarity by listening to the Calypso music that is so readily available. There's great stuff out there, you know, to be listened to and understood to project this. Let's listen. Yeah, before you go on, I've been meaning to come in on this in all the webinars that we've done this week. But whenever this song plays, I am so reminded of Harry Belafonte's Island in the Sun, oh, yeah. which the younger oh. teachers may not identify with, but it was a great hit and a great favorite of people in our teenage years. I had to say this today because Absolutely. this is the last one in the I, intermediate <laughs> level. So please Absolutely. do continue. Absolutely, Island in the Sun is really what it's, Island in the Sun is what it's all about. And as you can see, if you really want to draw your audience along with you, just think of being on an island with that landscape of sun and sea, with a bright and bold projection of the melody chords. Of course, this Absolutely. music is above all, the so is very rhythmic. And the rhythm in the original Calypso songs is expressed through tambourines and little gentle tappings of the hand drum and so forth. And one of the wonderful things about the piano is its ability to mimic and reproduce the sound, the tonal quality and the character of other instruments. So here, that percussive nature of the music can be very well applied and that certainly will be assessed. There are tied and dotted notes to aid that. And that is how the Calypso rhythm will be communicated, that very, very foot tapping, infectious beat. There are nuances too in this piece. There's a chromatic movement in bar 13, if you look at the score again, 
there are triplets and there's a lovely lyrical, slightly sad feel in the B section to present evidence, plenty of evidence there to do a thoughtful interpretation. Let's look at the next section, which is me and the instrument for accuracy, fluency, and of course, adding up to musical awareness because a sound technique must always, always support musical awareness. There is a rhythmic pattern. It's an ostinato rhythmic pattern in the left hand, which goes throughout and, you know, it's like a thread and it binds that piece together. And I think consistent in realizing that and keeping it consistent and at the same dynamic level, at the same tempo, very steadily is important. That is an aspect of technique that will be assessed. And at the same time, keeping that baseline always as an underpinning to the melody chords, never letting it overpower the melody. The dotted rhythms must be observed precisely and very crisply, but at the same time, there must be enough musical awareness to know that the relaxed feel of the music shouldn't be lost. If you see at the end of B section, there's a slight lingering, there's a very nice writ over there and that must be uh, projected and that must be executed in a very natural manner to convey that sense of a return. All this means sound musical awareness while playing the subtle dynamic shifts. And of course, there's that wonderful fermata at the end, which again must be realized both technically and musically so that it seems that the music is lingering even after it's over. Moving on to grade five, we come to a challenging work. All classical sonatas were technically and musically challenging, as is this one. It is Allegro by uh, the great Bohemian composer Dushek. And he was himself a very virtuosic pianist whose works influenced great composers like Beethoven. And it is, you will see that when you hear this music. So supporting an intention in playing a piece like this, knowledge of the sonata form is really, really crucial. Understanding that there are three sections to it, the exposition, the development, the recapitulation, that they have different natures, but they are linked through key and through thematic material. All this must be understood and known, generally as well as, and then applied to this piece. There should be familiarity with the early classical style because it has performance hallmarks, it's elegant, it's known as style galant. There is precision of rhythm and even articulation. Of course, the uh, voicing is important here because it has to be well balanced because as with all classical music, which started moving away from Baroque polyphony into a more homophonic style, the voicing means that the melody line should always be above the accompaniment and using dynamic contrasts to convey the character of the piece. Let's hear it. Thank you. 
Yes. How do we draw our audience into a work like that? So elegant, so polished. Well, of course, shaping phrases, showing a clear awareness of cadence points so that you know the music is always building up towards something and then doing a very smooth transition between the sections and the many wonderful little musical ideas. A word here about the title, Allegro. Of course, while the Allegro tempo is on the faster side of, uh, of the tempo spectrum, much more than that, it is actually means cheerful and lively. And to really give a, a nice riveting performance of this piece, that lively and cheerful aspect must be brought out. And then, of course, there are the ornaments, which always enhance the music and just give it that feeling of elegance that really pleases the listener so much. A lot of good detail over there that is required to personally interpret this piece. If you look at the technical details and the technique that is required, of course, like with all classical sonatas, there is a lot. The scales, the broken chords themselves are challenging because they require fluent movement, very even articulation. Uh, I don't know, you may have uh, felt that the piece was speeding up and slowing down. I did, but that is, of course, as you would understand, those are technical glitches and nothing to do with Fibish's work. Uh, there's a smooth and connected playing of the, connect, of the consecutive sixths. And of course, the Alberti bass. The Alberti bass must always be realized lightly, precisely, but never in an overpowering way. And the dynamic contrasts too need to have understanding and skill. There are lots of turns and trills. And of course, as someone's very rightly said, trills are not difficult to play. It's ending them that is the technical challenge. And so it is here, those turns and trills must be precise and they must end in a polished manner. We have another piece coming up again, and we have a picture for you to look at. Why? That wonderful little a dramatic impression of a wave breaking of a shore is what has inspired this work, Large Wave by contemporary British composer, Pam Wedgwood. This is part of her series called Piano Gallery, which is of course based on great paintings. This one is called The Great Wave of Konagawa, which is a 19th century Japanese artist, painter, woodcutter, so this is this work, as you can, when you hear it, you will understand how the composer has taken inspiration from the work. In me and the music, the first thing is that understanding and having a knowledge of this context, of course, and then understanding and being able to realize that very seamless legato flow of notes interspersed with pauses. The pauses perhaps could be when the waves are breaking upon the shore and they seem to, for a moment, be still. But a lot of imagination needed there for me and the music. There are tone colors here because there are many changes of register and the ebb and the flow of the water, the wave-like movement must be well realized through the dynamics and changes of pulse. So there is a lot of skill, knowledge and understanding here. Let's hear it.
What a wonderfully evocative piece. I think this is really meant to be performed on a concert platform because there is so much that an audience can really identify with in this piece. There is a lot of freedom of tempo here in this piece, of course. And one of the things that helps that is a good understanding of the changing time signatures. The fermatas, of course, are there, but that is the nature of the fermata is that it must always be understood in context to the music. A tone picture is being painted here of an image, of a scene, of a narrative. Such pieces, such pieces of program music really, really lend themselves and show that this is really the piano is mimicking or trying to reproduce the sound of another instrument, the Japanese chordophone known as the koto. And that kind of plucking action, that rapid movement, very delicate at all times, all these things go towards creating the feeling of what this music is about. Of course, there are plenty of technical challenges, so me and the instrument is going to keep the performer quite busy. A lot of accuracy is also needed despite the freedom of tempo because there are different time signatures, there are changing note values, and those must be precisely observed. The higher registers of the piano come into play here and both hands have to be in a position to be able to execute those notes with fluency and with assurance. Pedaling is very important here but it should always be accurate and not blur the harmonies. There are so many dynamic ranges and you would have noticed that at points there is the changes of dynamics are simultaneous and different in each hand and that requires considerable technical command. So the legato phrases too go towards really building up the kind of technical fluency and control that is needed in this piece. And of course, we had talked earlier about how contemporary music does go beyond major and minor tonality. So this piece, of course, used the mode and this mode was the Locrian mode on C. And now, handing over to Anjali, we'll talk a little more about the learning-based outcomes-based teaching and learning process. Thank you, Priya. So, some wonderful information there. And before we end this section about the pieces and the repertoire, just a few words on how important the outcome-based approach to teaching and learning is becoming. It does create transparency for the student as well as the crediting body. It starts with a specification of what the student will expect to achieve by the end of any level. These learning outcomes are about knowledge acquisition, mastery of skills, development of attitude or ability. And the assessments then are designed to test this. They test it in such a way so as to enable students to work towards achieving the stated outcomes. So it is important to use this in our teaching. It's a great teaching tool, as Priya said, right at the outset of this present, uh, of this section. So it's important that we realize that and go and delve a little deeper into the pieces that we are teaching and the children are learning. So a quick poll question here before we move on to the last sec section of the presentation. We are going to now apply the assessment criteria to the technical work. Technical work is all about control, coordination and accuracy. And the assessment criteria requires that the student demonstrate familiarity with the fundamentals of instrumental command. Technical control and facility should be displayed within the set tasks. So this section assesses the candidate's performance 
in a range of technical work requirement. So let's have a look at what this means in the piano. We have two sets of technical work. We have the scales and arpeggios and the technical exercises. The scales and arpeggios are not just a series of notes. They are assessed for agility, harmonic and melodic skills, focus and precision, rhythmic shaping, very important here. The shape, you can give it a shape. As I said, it's not just playing each note by itself. Articulation and dynamic control. And lastly, steadiness of tempo. The candidates need to perform these and perform them musically and with technical skill. The exercises are composed short pieces and they are designed to develop and demonstrate three areas of technique in performance. The first is tone, balance, and voicing. The second is coordination. And the third is finger and wrist strength and flexibility. And it's a good idea to do these along with pieces that contain these techniques. For instance, if you are teaching remembrance, do the tone balance and voicing exercise. So it's, you must look at the exercises in relation to the pieces that you are teaching. And the most important thing here is that you need to perform your technical work. It's a performance. And more so in this digital exam where overall performance is marked. So it's important to know that. The supporting tests. The supporting tests are there in face-to-face -face exams. Everyone knows what they're all about. It's a response of the learner to set musicianship tests. So the learner should be able to recognize and respond to elements of music in a practical context also demonstrate basic oral and musical awareness. I'd like to actually dwell a little more on the overall performance, which has replaced supporting tests in the digital exam. As I've said in all my presentations, I had a teacher asking me whether the marks for overall performance are free marks. Absolutely not. If you look at what the demand is in the overall performance, you will realize there are no free marks being given here. Performance delivery and focus is one part of it. And assurance and continuity of this delivery is the second part, 10 marks each. So consistency of focus needs to be there in your performance. The demonstration of a musical personality and the ability to work within, move between, and maintain styles. So let's try and look at this from the point of view of the examiner. This is the assessment criteria used by the examiner, and it is contained in the Digital Graded Exams Syllabus Book, which is available for free download on our website. So the two sections, if you want to score a distinction in the first, the performance must be delivered with assurance and transition between items should be smooth. Focus is very important here. And in the second section, if you want your distinction marks, you have to portray a convincing level of personal investment and commitment in the performance. And as I said earlier, to be able to maintain styles and move between different styles. So showcasing different styles becomes important here because the overall performance will judge that. And you can go through the rest of it as to how you get a merit or a pass, what is the criteria. 
So though this is a substitute for supporting tests, the overall performance has the same purpose of assessing the broader musical skills. It's not about just the pieces or the technical work. It's about your whole performance of both these elements of the exam. So a few things here we can talk about as far as the piano goes for overall performance. What can get you good marks and what we should be practicing? We need to prepare for this overall performance section because it requires an assured performance and practice makes perfect. Correct posture at the piano, distance from the keyboard, feet in correct position, page turns handled skillfully. This needs practice and you must prepare for that. From one piece to another moving in a very relaxed manner, not stopping, keeping the flow of the performance going, even if you do make an error. The beginning and end of a piece is important and it should be confident and in time. And lastly, realizing all performance directions so that you are able to produce a fluent and cohesive performance. The second part, the musical awareness of the overall performance requires personal interpretation and a stylistic understanding. Style is very important and we are now seeing that, perform, uh, that examiners are paying attention to this from even the initial and grade one levels. Versatility in projecting a variety of styles and a clear knowledge of structure of your piece and what the composer intended, which is why it's important to go into a little background and try and research what, when this piece was written and what was the composer intending in the piece. And of course, the piano being the instrument it is, it has unique properties, make full use of these like tone color, dynamic range, registral range, pedals, so that you can fully bring out the character of the music. And if you bring together all of these elements in your performance, it will show thoughtful practice and nobody can take away these 20 marks from you. So I hope that this, this has taken away the fact that these are free marks and you do need to work towards this. So there are two poll questions before we end this presentation. I'm also just going to talk about the resources and support available to you all. Our website has a dedicated page of resources for all our instruments, the exam work, the videos of the pieces. There are blogs by examiners. There's guidance for supporting tests and own composition. And there are Spotify playlists of all the pieces. And this is what it looks like if you see at the bottom of the screen. These are regularly updated and new resources are added. So please do go and visit this. You can go to trinitycollege.com slash resources, or you can go through our India website, which is trinitycollege.in. And of course, we are always there for you, the whole academic team. This is all the piano specialists that we have. Our email IDs are here. You can contact us whenever you want. Please get in touch. We are always there to answer all your questions.